Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out for our panel. Sorry for the delay. Everyone was a little busy doing their other panels. Uh, I'm Norman Golightly. I'm the founder of Is It Funny or Offensive? We are a social media company uh, about humor. We're interested in what's okay, what's not, where's the line, is there a line at all? If so, who draws it? Uh, we seem to have struck a bit of a uh, nerve in the social cultural conversation about that topic in just three years we've amassed 1.6 million followers on Facebook and there seems to be some headlines about this topic just about every day so we're thrilled to sit here uh, with this panel a very diverse panel which I'm happy to say and uh, we'll just introduce quickly Randy Sklar Michael Knowles Oh, it's a split room. This is going to be good. Ida Rodriguez. <laughs> Lauren Chen, also known as the Roaming Millennial. And John Fugelsang. So, horse face. Uh, uh, we're going to talk a lot about Trump today because, of course, we are, but I, I want to set the table to say that it's not gonna be necessarily a Trump bashing conversation. It's sort of that he has, it may be, but not for everyone. He sort of swung the magnetic poles a little bit in, in how we talk, I think, and it affects sort of how his supporters act and joke and how people on the other side then react to them. So I think there is a, there's a swing going on and I wanna talk about all of it today. Um, Starting out, just let's talk about the tweeting and whether we think his use of Twitter and some of the language, we can talk about horse face or some of the other things, is that a good thing or a bad thing for the country? Um, let's go, Michael. I love the tweeting. I love it. Despite the constant negative press, give me more Kofefe. It's so, so good. It's very important for a few reasons. One, uh, because the mainstream media had a lock on communication for decades and decades, and they would shut out conservatives, and when they didn't shut them out, they would distort conservatives' message, they would pervert it, they would misrepresent what conservatives were saying. Fortunately, with the new media, we're able to get past all of that, and it's why the right has done so well on new media, from the memes to the podcasts to YouTube to whatever. Uh, we've done well because for the first time, the right is allowed to get a message out unvarnished, and the right is having a very good time right now, so we've got a very good sense of humor. Uh, the Trump tweets are so important. You know, the, uh, I played the other day on my show a clip of President Trump at his cabinet meeting where he told everybody to decrease the size of the, each department by 5%, and I was falling asleep before the clip was over. Nobody would watch that. Nobody saw that clip. That was the same day that he tweeted about horse face. And everybody saw horse face. And the horse face tweet, unpleasant, distasteful though it may be, forced the mainstream media to talk about an issue that they wouldn't have talked about, which is that he won a judicial ruling, uh, a defamation ruling that was brought by uh, Stormy Daniels and Michael Avenatti. So uh, I, I, it clearly has an important political effect. It's disruptive in that we haven't had that for decades and decades. And the most important thing of all, is that it's very funny, you know, like Russell Crowe. Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? No, I'm really we're not. No, it's uh, we're not entertained by Russell Crowe throwing a phone <laughs> in his assistant. It's fucking stupid. Uh, the truth of the matter is, you can't have it both ways. You can't be like, I love the tweeting. It's so funny. It's so great. Then when he tweets something and he gets called to the carpet on it, you're like, but he, that, it's not. It, he, he says, this is our message. This is the way. The mainstream media is distorting the way the message goes. So we're going to send it directly to the people. And then when he tries to double down on something, it's like, no, 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 he, that, he wasn't meaning that. That's just him tweeting. Why can't you can't he have joke? it he's both ways. Yeah, yes, you can. He's joking. No, you cannot because he's telling a joke. But it can't be the pathway. He's not a funny person, though. He's so a very he's funny not, person. He's not, not very, at all. very funny. He's, he's the not greatest at all. showman of his age. He's not funny at all. So he's what I think is hilarious is that conservatives claim a man who has sex with a porn star that he paid for, has children from all these different women, and embodies so many of the things that they criticize people of color for. If Obama would have had a bunch of baby mamas, he would not be considered a conservative, right? So, Because he's not upholding conservative values. Before you try to interrupt me, white privilege, you're going to let me finish my sentence. Uh, you know, um, you know. There we go. You, you know, I have... Me... Uh... Do and I, you do guys can boo all you, you know, want. I'm, I'm not worried I'm about either. Sicilian, yeah, so I'm half Sicilian, so do I get oh, any privilege? Beautiful. You know, taupe privilege, beautiful. beige privilege, do I get any of that? Absolutely. Okay, you got all good. kinds of privilege. But what um, 
If you and I walk down the street, you know you got way more than I do. So let's stop it. And we'll stop with the booing. Relax. Um, anyway, what I was going to say is that the, the problem with the tweeting is that you are talking about the leader of the free world setting an example to, would you want your child behaving that way? No, I don't want them to behave like Bill Clinton. I don't want them to use people and like I'm not, human humidors. I don't want right, people to behave it. like politicians almost ever. Well, did you assume that I was um, here on behalf of Bill Clinton because no, I'm, I'm, I'm brown? No, I'm that Trump isn't unique in this regard, that okay. most politicians behave this way. Do they really? Have yeah. you ever? Do, where, where? Where do you see? Uh, most po most uh, politicians, Eric Schneiderman, Anthony most politicians Wiener, give Clinton. up their where tax returns as well. So most politicians show their tax returns. Most politicians don't have business interests in other countries that are conflicts of interest. Most, most, most politicians, are not successful. You're right. Most are not successful. Right. But that are conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest. Saudi Arabia. So let's not go too hard on Saudi Arabia. Hey, how much money did Saudi Arabia give the Clinton Foundation? Quick question. How many millions of dollars did Saudi Arabia, the Saudi government give the Clinton Foundation while well, she was Secretary of State? That's what I thought. Well, I think the whole thing with Horseface is, I mean, I, I appreciate transparency, and I think the whole idea of Twitter and having a direct line to constituents, whether it's the president or a senator or whatever, that's good. But we don't have to make calling someone Horseface a partisan issue. It's not nice to call someone Horseface. Let's, let's not call people Horseface. It's unchristian. Likewise, it's also not nice to... I don't know, describe people's genitalia using Mario Kart analogies. Like, I, I, and you earlier described this issue as like a Trump problem. I definitely think it's fair to say that the rhetoric being inflamed is, is partly because of Trump, but I think in a larger aspect, he's more a symptom of this problem than it coming from particularly him. That's fine, let's call it out when it happens, but I, I don't think this is exclusive to any one person. He's just one of the, I guess, loudest and most vocal examples of people just calling other people names, and it's, it's not helpful. I would argue it's also not funny, maybe that's up to debate, but yeah, I don't support that. Well, well, guys, if I may, we've all, guys, let's be real. Every one of us has had the experience of sleeping with a porn star a few days after our third wife gave birth to a baby, <laughs> and then years later paying her $127,000 to be quiet about it while also saying the affair never actually happened. We've all been there, but I will never call one of my porn star mistresses horse face because I'm a gentleman now. Um, <laughs> Liberals, shut up with throw Trump off Twitter. Stop saying this is hate speech. Stop trying to get him banned from Twitter. Those tweets will one day be admissible evidence and studied in law school and university. If it wasn't for the president's tweets, we would not be able to keep track of so many lies, so much obvious hypocrisy, which he doesn't mind because all he needs to do is have 30% of us swallow the hypocrisy and he gets away with it. We would not know that the president doesn't know how apostrophes work. We would not know that the president doesn't know the three branches of government were it not for his tweets. He really doesn't, check that shit out. My problem is, the mainstream media, which uses Trump as clickbait and eyeball bait, uh, then wagging a finger at how awful this man is. The reality is Trump tweets the ignorant shit in the morning, the media flips out about it all day, and then we don't talk about the actual offensive policies, which are a lot more offensive than the You're words. You're absolutely right. Because the You're day of horse face was also the day that he doubled down 100% on protecting the Saudi royal family from murder of a journalist. I would like to, John, you're absolutely right. That is the point. I mean, we're talking about the uh, usefulness of comedy in politics, of the tweets, of whatever. That is the usefulness, is that we get to reduce the uh, size of the government, we get to decrease taxes, we get to do whatever we want to do, and then all the media are chattering about is horse face, and it's working perfectly. So what's the other side? Let's talk about how Trump's opponents sh should respond to him. Should they respond in kind? Should they go high? What what should we do as a people? What should the other side do in response to Trump? I, I do have some thoughts on this. Don't try to be Trump. Don't, I mean, I'm, uh, this is a, truly a prudential warning to the left. Don't try to be Trump. Only Trump can be Trump. It doesn't work. Rubio tried to do it, didn't work. Chris Christie tried to do it, didn't work. Now you've got Eric Holder trying to do it. It does not work. Trump is an American original unless you are a brash dude with orange skin and yellow hair from Queens, New York. You are not going to pull it off. Don Rickles is dead. You're not going to be able to do it. He is Try not Don else. Rickles. He is not Don Rickles in any way, shape, or form. 
Yeah, that's Don the most offensive thing anybody's ever said. You know, said. people have to make compromises. Don Rickles didn't repeat his material that much. Uh, You're right, though. Marco Rubio, you know, it wasn't Donald Trump who told the first dick joke in a GOP presidential primary. It was Marco Rubio. He started it. And you're exactly right. Marco Rubio couldn't do it. Uh, Hillary Clinton mopped the floor with him in three debates, but that wasn't enough. You should not try to out-Trump Trump unless you actually know what you're doing. He is afraid of some people. Uh, and boy, oh boy, they're trying to shut those people down already. But um, yeah, you, you, you know, empathy, love, facts. Empathy, love, facts. If you hate Trump back, the hate will make you stupid and you will say dumb things that will ruin you and he will help you ruin yourself. So again, empathy, love, facts. And again, you're not gonna convince your Christian brothers and sisters that they voted for fucking Caligula. They don't care, it's a cult. We voted for You're Cyrus. not gonna convince people the fact that they have thrown out every teaching of Christ in the Beatitudes and Matthew 25 by voting for Caligula. You're not going to win would them you... over, but again, you can debate, but if you hate, you're going to lose, and if you go and try and go mean, you're going to lose. So again, know your facts, and don't debate in a vacuum. Debate when there's people around, bystanders, that you can sway, because you're not going to convince a cult member. You'll just make yourself look ridiculous. And for Donald Trump, uh, there are people who could handle him. He hasn't had the chance to debate them publicly yet, and he most likely never will. I, I can't let that comment go unresponded uh, to. I didn't uh, think you would. John, I know... I, I know that your parents were ex-religious. Uh, they were, you know, a monk and a nun, I think. Uh, w would you call yourself a practicing Christian? I think we're all practicing Christians because only one has so far ever gotten it right. <laughs> no, I, I think certain people can reject Jesus and uh, reject the teachings of Christ and reject the resurrection. Do you, I didn't would say you that. I didn't say that. Whoa, I didn't say that. I, didn't, I said rejecting the teachings of Christ. I didn't say anything about but, the resurrection. But Christ isn't a teacher. He's a savior. And I, I, the point I want to make on what this, What teaching I don't of Christ has Donald Trump tried to implement on a policy level? Uh, well, uh, he's saved uh, countless unborn by uh, Jesus by the never said anything about abortion. He what said, he said that whatever has... you do to the least of me will uh, cause you great trouble in the hereafter. Yeah, but and see, he here's the thing. That if you cause Jesus... one of the least of me to sin, okay. it would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and have you be cast into the sea. And President Folks, Trump is the may... most pro-life president. Is no, Well, the, the point I want to make on this is just the irony that so often people who the are Bible not practicing Christians, I'll just finish one second, uh, uh, that people who are not practicing Christians always lecture, we Christians, oh, lecture no, us no, Christians. Oh, no, 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 okay. Yeah. I'm not lecturing Christians. The Bible not says better you, uh, no, I've got you the, not be Sorry, born Michael, i got to respond to what Michael said. I'm sorry, Eden, but I'm going to pull white privilege and go. male privilege and cis privilege and all kind of privilege. Yeah. Um, go, go, go. go. The Bible's not against abortion. God gives Moses detailed abortion tips in Book of Numbers. In Exodus, he makes it clear. You strike a pregnant woman and the fetus dies. You pay a fine. She dies. What, you what, die. What else God does, does not put the law of Moses on the, the same Bible, level John. as a woman John, in the Bible. John, what else does Christ so say about the law of Moses of Christ? in the Bible? No, no, no. Hang on. What specific teaching of Christ has Donald Trump tried to implement on a policy level? You've misrepresented the view, uh, the uh, presence of abortion in the Bible, because as Christ says clearly, uh, because of the hardness of your hearts, the law of Moses was given to you, but from the beginning... Oh, that was about so. divorce laws. Right. That was it Jesus the overturning the Mosaic right. divorce laws in Matthew 19. I know exactly right. what you're talking about. I know about. you do. So, I know. I think that's the I, argument. Am I, right? Am, am I right? I wish that that's you were comedy. more truthfully representing the scripture. He's done very good on pro-life. <laughs> You're not answering the question, Michael. One teaching of Jesus, and we can move on to funny shit. Oh, he's done... Well, no, I, I can... I, I can. Well, first of all, the, the idea that Christ is primarily a teacher is absurd and un. Called him rabbi. He, no, he wasn't. He was a savior, and the, the fact of his death and resurrection are the I mean, key. They worship him as a god because the teachings are far too liberal. Christ no, stood up no. for the marginalized, what is, what is Saint and Donald say about Trump the government, on friend. attacking the marginalized, whether John. they be transgender kids, whether they be Muslim immigrants, despised minorities. He's been the opposite of Jesus every step of the way. And as a comedian, I don't claim to be a good Christian, man. I aspire to be a good Christian. I don't claim to be one, but I will call out a hypocrite. John, what... Uh, John, what... what John, what, what okay, is... Okay, uh, yes, we are back what, to the What does St. Paul say in Romans about the role of uh, the citizen to the government? And, and further, uh, you... you, you I'm so sorry, can you repeat that, please? Further, t t I, I would like to make one point on the parable of the talents, which is that it's... Yeah, I, so I was I'm, gonna, I'm answering I was gonna, my friend. I'm answering my friend. He brought it up. The, you. Yes, the, it was. A, well, then don't bring it up if you don't want to hear an answer. I think this happens a lot from our friends on the left. They bring up a point of which Christ. is absurd, and then when you respond to it, uh, oh. they tell you that you're starting right. the conversation. Audience, be nice, be nice. We got people from all sides here. Let's be respectful of everyone. 
Uh, and let's bring it back to comedy. Who? Who? Who's being a bully? Little old me? I don't think I'm a bully. I think I'm a. Okay. I'm perfectly he, unintimidated. He's not a bully. He's just right-wing talking points in a suit. That's it. That's. <laughs> I I am certainly right. That's that is tr you're right about that. Back to comedy. So, should there be a different set of rules for comedians than other people, like let's say the president? Is it a different set of uh, rules and standards for something said at the improv on a Friday night than what is said from the podium or at a press conference? I wanna hear from comedians and the non-comedians. Well, I think it's totally reasonable, even if you're a firm supporter of free speech and comedy, to talk about whether certain things are appropriate to say certain places and to certain people, right? I mean, is, is it appropriate to say uh, what a late night comedian might say to a world leader? I, I don't think so, right? And that doesn't mean you're anti-comedy, but I think it's just part of part and parcel of discussing how to navigate being an adult, right? Just because just you're able to say some things in certain contexts doesn't mean it's appropriate whether or not you should be allowed to is a different question. But yeah, I think it's absolutely reasonable to ask, is this okay in this context? I'd like to say that as a stand-up comedian, mm -hmm. what we do for a living, who gets to why do who gets to draw the line on what's appropriate for what to say, what we have to say? We are on the final frontier of what exactly. can be said, and I don't think that somebody sitting at home reading their Bible should tell a comedian who doesn't believe no in way. that Bible what they should or should not be able to say in, in the name of comedy. We are that we have to talk about it all, mm -hmm. and what what really bothers me is that when people say to someone like me, "Stick to comedy." Don't talk about politics. Those are the same people who think that George Carlin was a genius and never said to him that he should not talk about politics and he should stay out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with who is saying what You're and right. why and the people who think that I don't have the right or shouldn't be able to say the things that I'm saying because I'm not tap dancing for laughs or perpetuating stereotypes that make racist people comfortable with who I'm supposed to be. That's right. So yeah, and, I don't and, need anybody telling me what what I can and cannot I, say I, as a comedian. I agree with that. And when you want to talk about like a specific comedy club environment, people walk in there and there's an unwritten contract between the audience and the comedian that you're going to hear some stuff that you may not like. There are some boundaries that are going to be pushed, but you are there understanding that that is going to happen. And so if you tell a joke that doesn't work, then that's on the comedian. And you're out and you have to suffer the consequences of people not laughing. If the market you tell decides. What? The market decides. Yeah, exactly. The market will decide whether or not you can do the jokes that you do. And, you know, we travel around and do, I'm assuming you travel around and do comedy all over the country. And, you know, some jokes work in some places and some don't in other places because of the makeup of the people that are out there. But I say you got to tell them anyway. You got to get out yeah. there and tell them because even if you lose the audience for a little bit, you can always win them back. That's always a wonderful challenge. And the too. thing that you're right, and the thing to remember is that, you know, what's more subjective than that which is offensive? It's different to all of us, but the one beautiful thing brothers and sisters on the left and the right have in common, both liberals and conservatives love to be offended. We have a national umbrage addiction that is deeper than any opioid addiction, and both sides getting off on pointing the finger and uh, clutching their pearls. So it, it's highly subjective, and what I think is brilliant satire might be deeply vulgar to you, and we get to be grown-ups and try to get along anyway. I, I agree with what all of my left-wing friends have said here. I agree entirely. The question, though, is uh, not for working comedians. I go to a lot of comedy clubs. It's for uh, on television. I go, I watch Jimmy Kimmel, and Jimmy Kimmel can be funny. He, I'm not saying he's never funny. He can be. But then he cries. He goes on TV and he just cries and whines about politics. I saw that special, Nanette, on Netflix, and the woman comes out and she says, she tells some jokes, and then she says, I'm not going to tell any more jokes. I'm just going to talk about traumas in my life. And that's the new comedy. That isn't the new comedy. There's a word for that, which is called tragedy. And I think, you know, on this point, is there a line? The line is that it should be funny. I'm not saying, uh, you said that people have pressured you to do racist material. Don't do racist material. I'm just saying, do something that's funny. If you're not doing that, you're not doing comedy. Well, that's not funny for you, but a lot of people say that Nanette special was the greatest thing to come out in the last of few years. A lot of people say a lot of things, man. Right. It well, was and not that's funny. What, and it might that's, have been good, but it wasn't funny. But that's why comedy is a subjective thing. It's not funny to you because it's not speaking directly to the thing. If she did a bunch of jokes about, you know, guys gathering with tiki torches around a monument, that's, then that's, that would be hilarious. That's this is Let's what they do the when they have nothing now. to say. They call 
call you a racist. That's how you know you've won the argument. The, the point on Nanette is that she comes out and says, I'm not going to make you laugh. I'm not going right, to Right, but then jokes. what if she does make you laugh after but she that? Didn't. Maybe that was... She but didn't. I, because I think you she didn't succeeded. Find that funny. She succeeded very well in her so, job. And an artist did her thing. You didn't dig it. Watch something new. No, yeah. an artist did her thing. Right, but a comedian did not do her thing. Yeah, but she... But again, you defining what is comedy and what isn't comedy is the comedy last a definition, thing we need in this world. It has a definition. It's yeah. not subjective. Yeah, but if I were to tell a joke and, and you didn't find it funny, you would be like, that's not comedy. At least but you if, told a joke. No, I would say it's comedy. It wasn't good comedy. What she did was not comedy. She but it was about comedy. Events. It was about comedy. It was a monologue about what comedy is. And Correct. that's why yeah. it falls under and that by the way, And to, either way, it's a performance. And to come up it, with something great. new and a different way to present something. We see so many comedy specials that come out there the exact same thing with the exact same curtain and the exact same setup and the exact same jib shots and all that stuff. To come up with something new, I think that should be rewarded as well. Now, if you didn't laugh the whole time, then fine. That's and not what it what? is. And you know what? And I agree. And, and the thing about Nanette is I didn't think it was the funniest thing on the planet either. I will, I, but I do respect the fact, I fight for the right for her to be able to do that because for so many years, all we do is watch stand-up comedy coming from one perspective, hearing the same jokes over and over again that get told what Comedy Central. What perspective would you What's like? What's the to one hear? perspective? It's the same shit. It's all. It's the same. Um, the straight white guy talking about. What about the Chris Rock. What about Roseanne Barr? What yeah, about? Yeah, you're Griffin? talking about exceptions. Come you're not talking about the rule. Very famous. You're community. talking about the exceptions. You're not talking about the rule. And when you talk about Roseanne Barr, who was the 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 hated woman at one point, everybody hated her because of what she did to the uh, the national anthem. Who then became the hero to those same people? What are you talking about, Roseanne Barr? For Roseanne Barr is not somebody who's considered. I'm just saying there wasn't minority. one perspective. There yeah, were there were many perspectives. When you talk about the very few minorities who get through the cracks and get to a high level, you are not talking about comedy, the comedy that we have to go to every week, every single week. That's not the reality. It's Dane Cook. It's Daniel Tosh. It's the same perspective over and over again. Women get drunk and they act stupid. This is my jizz. This is what I do. We hear that over and over and over and over and over I, and over I agree that Dane Cook is not a good comedian. And, it, and, it's, all, and it's all the time. So when a woman comes across and tells her story and you decide that you don't like it, you know how many other specials there are with people who look like you, think like you, and talk I, it like you It isn't that I didn't on, like on it, it's that she that wouldn't tell watch. jokes. That's what no, I No, I mean, I, but that's her version. I didn't like it either. You just said I it wasn't said funny. I said yeah, I didn't think it was funny. I, I would like, argue that... But that's her version of telling jokes. Uh, let, okay, put aside what you know about Louis C.K. at this point, after what he's done, Okay. <laughs> But I would argue that his specials and his comedy, and because I saw him and have worked you know, in clubs with him from, for the last 20 years, that he initially started off as an absurdist guy, writing absurd jokes and absurd things. And then at a certain point, he was like, I'm just going to tell the truth. I'm, this, I'm not writing jokes. I'm just going to tell the truth. And he did that in a number of specials before all the shit went down with him. And I would argue that that was the funniest shit out there. And so, you know, he wasn't telling one giant truth in his life. And that, you know, and I think that's going to make it hard for to move forward. But I would say that, like, that wasn't jokes. So... You know, we can't tell, like, Eddie Izzard, does he tell jokes? No, he kind of goes through history and whatnot. It's, there, comedy can be very different things. You're talking about someone who's in a comedy team, and the stuff that we do plays more like music. Yes, there are jokes written in it, and yes, we are trying to write the funniest things that we can all the time, but, like, that's what we do, and that's separate from even what you were saying, one person giving one perspective down the pipe. And so I just think comedy can be a lot of things. And even if she's saying, I'm not going to tell jokes, I'm going to tell these stories. I'm it, not going to be funny. No, no, she said, I'm not going to, whatever she said. But I'm just saying that like she, I'm not going to be funny. I'm just going to tell these stories. There were people laughing and there are people laughing at that. So it's just not, it's not making you laugh, but there are other people who are laughing in other ways. So I just think you have to understand that. It's just, you can't say this is not funny. No, I feel like I'm in the YouTube not funny. section. No, because you know what's funny is that there are different uh, types of comedy. There's alternative comedy. There's physical comedy. There's musical comedy. So that that falls into one of those categories of comedy. And I think that it's so telling about how much sexism female comedians have to experience in comedy when one comedy special, just one, it has drawn so much criticism and has come under fire so much when there are so many male comedians whose specials a lot 
lot of people don't consider are funny and doesn't cause so much of a stir. Like, she is a woman, a lesbian from Australia that told a very specific story that a lot of people responded to. Can you just let her live? Yes, she can live. I'm not trying to stop her from living, but the reason that people responded to it, there are plenty of specials that bomb and nobody watches them and nobody talks about them and nobody cares. Her special bombed, but it, it, in... We're all talking about think it, it six bombed. months that, later. That's, that's fake news. It, I'm just saying, yeah, I did. I, so, well, no, I watched the whole thing because I'm a masochist, but a lot of people did change the channel. And the fact is, what was offensive about what she did is simply offensive to logic because she tried. I agree, so there you are feel lots like, of comedy. You feel like she's just getting away with something here. No, no, no. I that, think she's getting away with calling it a comedy special when it's not a comedy I'm special. I'm saying, par, par, I'll, I'll actually I'll move this forward. Because if you want to talk about getting away with something, no, no, you can I, have a nice long conversation. Of no, like, what, what, I, what I'm like, saying is that... Uh, when we talk about the response to political correctness, you know, President Trump ran against political correctness. Political correctness is essentially using respect and lies and words that don't mean what they mean. Manners and politeness are respect. Political correctness is something different. And I think people are offended when they see a, a phrase refer to something that is not that phrase. And that is exactly what that woman did in Nanette. Is she said, this is comedy. I don't care. Maybe it was good tragedy, but it wasn't comedy. And I think it's the same thing. When someone sees an illegal alien and Trump, political correctness uh, and, and a Democrat you. says that Show this me is on a the dreamer. doll where political correctness took the jam out of your Twinkie because political correctness is using language to redress grievances. Does it go too far? Yes. I was hosting a VH1 show. I called Naomi Campbell a beautiful black supermodel. They upgraded me and said, call her African American. I said, she's British. Yes, it goes too far. But at the end of the day, political correctness is basically us as a culture coming together trying to be less dickish to people, and if that offends you, no, I think it's you're going to have a really hard I think time it's bullying in language century. that hides real truths. Uh, if I refer to an illegal alien, I'm talking about a real thing. If I refer to a dreamer, I could refer to anybody. We all have dreams at night. If I refer to an undocumented worker, that could be me when I was 14. We all were working off the books, right? But what w the reason they use those words is they don't want to deal with the reality of the question. Illegals is, is an dehumanizing, otherizing term. Donald Trump had to pay 20 Right, they're other. They're not in America. Right. Would you call Donald Trump an illegal because he ripped off American uh, taxpayers with a scam online he's university? He's not an illegal alien. He's an American but citizen. But I'm talking about the slur illegals. Would you call Donald Trump an illegal because Ill he broke the law? Illegal refers to a wide variety of crimes. Illegal alien I've refers to one crime. I've only heard it described crime. with people with brown skin. That's why I'm asking. Wait, what was that? If you drive 56 in a 55 zone, bro, you're an illegal. Yeah, you're an illegal driver. Term well, it's actually not marginalized criminal. Marginalized right? brown people. It's not criminal, but if you're driving 100 in a 50, sure, you're an illegal driver, but you're not an illegal alien, and I think we should speak frankly. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the term illegals. When I say it's political correctness, yeah, it's an otherizing term meant to make Christians think these aren't actually children of God. They're not actually No, it's ma humans. meant to make them realize they're not American citizens, which they're not. Right, but they are not American citizens. No one's claiming they are. Just not using slur talk like illegals is just an attempt to be less dickish to an already marginalized people. And Imp shitting on marginalized people is, not, uh, is how Donald Trump has appealed to a certain kind of white voter. I know that my friend is confused about uh, scripture, but imprecise language is, is, is not good and precise language is not a What am I confused about? Sin. You're going back to this old thing to pick on me again. I'm not your enemy, you man. Brought up, you brought up the Christians again, pal. Right, but we moved on from that to talk about get Netflix for 20 minutes. Uh, right, and then you brought them up again just now. So I'm just responding okay, to Okay, but what my point is, we, political correctness in and of itself is not an evil thing. Trying to be kinder to our fellow humans is not a negative thing. But, but, but lie, lying is a negative thing, and using language that lies is a negative thing. The, don't go down the path of lying is a negative thing when Trump is your boy. I mean... <laughs> He's lied up and down the fucking line. You want to talk about lying? That's like, let's get You know, get he, he tells some white lies. He does tell some lies about the crowd. Stop, stop. He does. You, you've lost all credibility he right here. No, you've I lost haven't it lost all. all credibility you can, at you all, You cannot my make another statement. I stop. I can make another stop. statement. I think I can. Everything I think you say lying. after this point is not valid. I don't think that's nope. quite right. You just right, assume right. that he's a liar and you already called him Tell me more about how much Saudi Arabia gave the Clintons. What I think actually. That's not the point. I'm just Tell me more how much your boy is protecting Saudi Arabia who murdered a journalist because he himself. This he is the truth. A radical Islamist, this is the truth. A journalist who worked for the Washington Post, who Donald Trump has a problem with the press. Donald Trump has taken yes. the truth.
and well. totally bastardize it. So there is no more truth, which as a comedian, I'll fucking bring it back. As a comedian, all we have is truth because that's what we're basing off of. And if everybody accepts something as the truth, Donald Trump, his legacy is that he has obliterated truth in this country. There's 30% of this country that does not believe what is actually true. And the rest of the country knows okay, it. Okay, this I think it's more like 50 I'm, if you ask me. All right. So, Lauren, Lauren, you want to get here. I have a question for you. So you mentioned political correctness is about being kinder, but you're, you're bringing in specific instances of language. So, okay, when we're talking about the realm of comedy, do you think there is a place for a comedian to use irreverent language and yeah. have it be, quote, funny? I do. And again, you know, offensiveness is in the eye of the beholder, and I'm not here to dictate content to anybody. You know, you can go to a club and some guy will attack really much. You're like, go to a club sometime and you'll see somebody really punching down, like against ho homeless people jokes, or they'll say, they'll tell, uh, retard jokes. I mean, adults still talk that way in some clubs. And, you know, it might be funny for five minutes because you're drunk, then you feel dirty afterwards. But, like, it goes both ways because I'm guilty of it, too. You, you know, I, I, I defend political correctness in theory. You take a Trump speech about political correctness and replace that term with respect. The American people are tired of having all this respect jammed at our throats. You're forcing all this respect for other people on us. And I'm all talk, right? But then I told a joke a couple of weeks ago uh, where I got really hit hard and I learned about my own uh, uh, fallibility and hypocrisy because uh, when everyone thought Mike Pence might have written the anonymous op-ed because it had the word Lodestar, and I told a harmless joke that I knew it was Mike Pence because Lodestar happens to be his uh, username on Grindr. Now. <laughs> It was funny. I have, hang on, I've spent, I've spent my whole life since I was 13 years old, like fighting homophobia and using the Bible to fight homophobia because you can't use the Bible to be mean to same sex relationships. So I went back to this guy saying, I, no, I wasn't homophobic. It's a, it's a homoerotic joke about a homophobic guy. The guy's like, no, you're a homophobe. You're not an ally. And I was like, dude, look at the context. There's no gay people being mocked here. I'm mocking a heterosexual homophobe. No, you're saying all gay sex is icky. I was like, bro, penises are always funny regardless regardless of the gender they're being put into. Uh, straight sex is funny, gay sex is, no, and finally the guy's like, no, you're not an ally, you're mocking I'm like, well stop being so politically correct. Oh fuck, I did it. So, <laughs> like I'm guilty of it too. And it's all because something's political correctness that's being language police until it's something we agree with. So again, as grownups, we have these debates and we fight our way through it. And the comedians are the ones on the front lines, way braver than politicians or the media, yeah. pushing that line, finding where that line is, willing to offend people, willing to cost themselves work because they're the real fighters for the First Amendment. There, there is a show at the Comedy Store on Tuesday nights called The Roast Battle that was on Comedy Central. I highly recommend anybody here who lives in L.A. to come to that show. It's like 11 o'clock. It is in that room upstairs in the belly room. The ghosts of the Comedy Store exist in there, but it is... There's comedians calling each other out and then doing the most offensive jokes at each other that they can possibly come up with, and they are amazing. And in this climate and time, you have to be creative. If you're just mean, it won't work. If you are creative and it is a brilliant joke, no matter how mean or how off color or how politically incorrect it is, the audience will reward you. And they're not that, hateful. They're not hating each other. They're not, not hateful. Negative. And in that, and if you come across as hateful, you you get stuffed by the audience. It's unbelievable how the the room equalizes itself. And there is a freedom in there, I think, made possible by how tight political correctness has put a grip on the rest of the world that. There's a freedom in that room that mm -hmm. I just can't describe it. It's it's unbelievable. And I wish more of like in a comedy sense we could get to that place, but it's difficult. It's difficult because you do have people out there who will call you out now more than ever on social media. And that's liberals and conservatives again who just love being offended. Um, we talked about Louis C.K. a little bit ago. How do we separate the art and the artist? Can we still love Louis C.K.? Can we love Bill Cosby? Can we love Roseanne? And we also talked about Roseanne. Did she have the right comeuppance for her activities? I think you can, talk, I'll, I'll defend all those lefty, you know, Louis C.K. or whatever. I, I think you can separate the art from the artist. A lot of my favorite authors in all of history were dirty, rotten scoundrels. Uh, some great people, uh, people who have done great things have been uh, pretty rotten in certain occasions, maybe including our president, I don't know. Um, so I certainly think you can separate yeah. the art from the artist. And, uh, 
and I, I thought the I understood the response to Roseanne. Of course, she was going to get fired for that, especially in this climate. That is the funniest thing you said the whole time that Trump that that Trump is an artist. Just let everybody know. Oh, that. he's that's, quite an artist. That's the funniest thing you he said. Is, my friends on the left say he's a con artist, but he's a real he's a Twitter artist. He's a good hilarious. Artist. All right. Yeah. But uh, I thought the response to Roseanne, I, I think in the light of day, even people on her show, John Goodman, are saying it was, it was an overreach. And, uh, but they've got to protect Calling their Calling a black person jobs. a monkey? Bit of an overreach. Well, she said she didn't know. And she took a lot of Ambien. I don't know. I don't care about Roseanne Barr. I don't care to defend yeah. her. Okay. What I'm just saying is that uh, people say offensive things. You just said comedians say horribly offensive things. And uh, I can still enjoy Bill Cosby's comedy, even while r- keeping perfectly clear in my mind that he did horrific things for a very long time. Yeah, because you're not a woman. Um, so it's okay to listen to somebody joke about putting quaaludes in people's dr- drinks while you have sex. I can them. still enjoy Kathy Griffin's pseudo comedy, okay. even though she said she wants to cut off the heads of Yeah, Republicans. but you're, you're equating you a sexual enjoy. offender to a woman who made a, po- a, a joke in poor taste. Yeah, you're talking about Republican. somebody who yeah. broke the law. Well, you can laugh about that because you're not a Republican. You know, oh, you that's know why. what? And I'm not a Democrat either, so stop making that assumption. I that didn't because, make any assumption. Okay, because you, you keep calling me a lefty you keep calling me the people no, I don't on the think other I called side you a lefty. listen you, you have you called you called us all uh, me. no I was talking about uh, my Your friends. friends at the ends of the table okay not you okay well this is what I wanted to say about Bill Cosby and um Roseanne Barr Roseanne Barr uh who actually has been a mentor to me and has been very kind to me in my in my life so I I've never public publicly spoken about her because of the relationship that I have with her Um, But what I will say about Louis C.K., Louis C.K.'s history is that one that obstructed the path of the women that he sexually assaulted, right? So if if you want to enjoy his comedy, and you can, because that is your right, right? No, nobody, that just speaks to who you are. Full disclosure, I'm not a huge Louis C.K. fan. I'm just saying you can separate art from an artist from his art. Okay, well, I think that the problem is that that mentality has been so problematic because the people who we separate the art from the the artist, for, for example, Woody Allen, who was a pedophile, and we talk about Roman no, Polanski. Huh? I, 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 that's... Uh, I, I, I think separating the art from the artist is right, but I, I get in trouble for this. Uh, there, there, is, there are those who are not convinced he's actually a pedophile. Terrible boyfriend, but... Uh, Okay, well, you know, the other the other son has who's a family therapist has come forward and said that that's not true. Okay, well, the argument that's, that's the that these people, Roman Polanski and the people, no debate there. Okay, there we go. So let me let me find the right one. All right. So, but because <laughs> there's so many to choose from, <laughs> I agree. But what I'm saying is that this is the argument um, about you and Nanette. You thinking Nanette is not funny, then people who think that and dudes Nanette who pull out their Nanette penises. No, no, but she said she wasn't going to tell jokes, right? I'm going to make people laugh. Yeah, Absolutely. so some co- she said she wasn't going to tell jokes from that point forward, which is some comedians tell jokes and some comedians are storytellers. Everybody she wasn't telling doesn't... funny stories either. She was telling tragic stories. They, no, I'm, okay, I'm who, who to... enjoyed Nanette in here, please? So there's a group of people who thought it was, it was funny. Yeah, like it wasn't people. funny. I don't really know. Who doesn't know what we're talking about with Nanette? Yeah, it's more mm-hmm. everybody doesn't want. Next question. Nanette. Uh, one of the things that's in very vogue right now is digging up people's old behavior and holding it up to today's standards. People's tweets from years ago, their yearbooks. Is that a fair thing? Is your past fair game by today's standards? Um, I think social media is awesome, but also so scary. And I think the most recent example of this is probably James Gunn, or at least the biggest one. Um, And not only are we digging up people's past, but we're also taking what they've said, regardless if it's inappropriate or not. I thought it wasn't. In, inappropriate, and we're not only are we shaming them for making jokes about it, but we're also attributing those beliefs as if they actually had them, right? You're not just someone who who joked about this. You actually, this is proof you're a pedophile, and I don't think that's okay. And especially for people who have been in the entertainment industry for a long time, I mean, to hold them to today's standards of what is and what is not acceptable, uh, especially like when you take things out of context, like a lot of James Gunn's tweets specifically were. I think it's just it's bad news for anyone who's in the public spotlight whether you're on the left or on the right. But there's no way, that's a great point. That is a great point. There's there's really no way, you made those tweets. I think people should have to answer for those tweets and whatever their response is, 
then it's like if you've ever been in a relationship with someone or you have kids and they do something wrong or you do something wrong, there is a very specific apology you have to give in order for everybody to move on. One that shows you understand the gravity of what you did that was wrong and whatnot, especially when it comes to tweeting and digging up things from the past in terms of you know like your social media footprint as far as that's concerned. I think if you do offer up an explanation, then we should move forward. It should not threaten work in, as far as that goes. But like, you know, I just think like you need a very specific, you have to answer everything that was there in a way that sat, and there is a satisfying thing. It's hard to put your finger on, but there is a satisfying answer that satisfies everybody and satisfies the majority of the population. You just have to get there with it. I totally I agree. But in the case of James Gunn, and I'm, I may sound like the conservative here now, but like, um. Yeah, reading his joke, it's clear he's telling a joke. Disney fired him because they were afraid of what would happen if when their children's comic book movie opened, what some parents would say about having a guy who jokes about raping kids, direct a film for kids, Guardians 3. So while I was sad he was fired because he's a terrific filmmaker and I like those movies, at the end of the day, when we as artists work in a corporate medium, we are subject to the dictates of the people who write the checks. So Disney had every right to fire him. I was thrilled that DC hired him just last yeah. week to do the R-rated Suicide Squad 2 because he's a great filmmaker. And I think that that, that actually, you know, he's had his punishment, but he's still going to have a chance but to work. John, but what about, I mean, if he would have made that joke and made that tweet currently after he was hired by Disney to do this movie, I can understand Disney being like, you're gone. Oh, I'm with I you. understand totally. the with concern you that you had and that I thought it was wrong of them to do it. I'm just saying that, like, for something that happened long before you ever even got into this, and it was, you need to answer for it. Yes, this was a joke. It happened to Trevor Noah when he took over Daily Show. They found all of his old, you know, fat chick jokes from 10 years ago and used them against him. (laughs) They did. And I think everyone can understand Disney's market reasoning for it. Um, But I think that kind of reasoning leaves people open to, do you have to be purity tested as an artist in order to participate? Not that I'm saying that. No, no, I know, but Um, it's it's the the dilemma we all face. Right. And, you know, I mean, you have people like Rihanna now who have been in kids movies, right? And I mean, obviously the kinds of videos, music videos she makes, the lyrics she writes, those aren't for children. So I I think we should be able to separate artists like that. And I think if, if a parent is mad about, you know, this one specific person, they're free to not purchase that film, and in which case Disney's going to have to do some calculations whether it's worth it. But at the end of the day, if you're a parent and your kids are seeing that kind of material, that's on you to monitor them more. Absolutely. That's not the, uh, the and and I, I agree with Michael's point that we do have to set, we have to separate the art from the artist. I know it might sound like bullshit. Bill Cosby is the single greatest live comedian I have ever seen in my life, and I've seen him more than once. And I, no one can do what he does. And he raped over 45 women. So, you know, I have no problem with saying, yes, the comedy was great and the man has to go away. John Lennon beat his first wife. Does that mean I have to throw out all my Beatles albums? Or do I recognize that we're all sinners, we're all fucked up in our own ways, and I can still enjoy the music uh, because John, in the case of Lennon, you know, spent 10 years writing feminist songs apologizing for being a violent bad man. But uh, it, generally, the market will decide. The market that's will. why you can have James Franco do what he did and show his dick in an acting class and he can't get an Oscar nomination. But Gary Oldman beat the shit out of his wife's face with a phone receiver in front of their kids, and he won the actual Oscar. So our outrage levels are very subjective, no matter who we are. I think the market will bear it out, because in the case of Cosby, I mean, I would argue that Cosby himself, which was especially recorded in like 1983 or 84 in Toronto, where he's just sitting down, is one of the single greatest specials I've ever seen. It was so influential for me and my brother watching that. It's just brilliant, 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 brilliant. But if I were to go back and watch it now, I it. just would have a problem. I would yep. just be thinking about a guy who, even after that taping, probably raped a woman. You're like, I bet he, or, or whatever, you know? I mean, just even if that's in my thought, in my, I'm suddenly taken out of the brilliance of his comedy, and I'm agree. thinking about him as a person. Same with, And I will and, never watch his stand-up again. And, and so I think, like, yeah, and he only has himself to blame for that, but I'm just saying that, like, that it does work its way in, in a comedy sense, and you can't, you want to separate it, but I don't think you can in the end because it's just, the creep level is just there. You just can't. Yeah. I don't. You throwing out all the Harvey Weinstein movies? What are, can you smile more? <laughs> <laughs> Why? I had a question for you, and then we'll branch out. Uh, you know that's politically incorrect. <laughs> I'm supposed to ask a woman That's to why smile. I, said it. I know, but um, do, do, does yeah, that mean you throw the me, Harvey Weinstein? Me too. In comedy, is 
what the, what has the effect been to you as a female performer? Is, is it empowering? Does it give you more to talk about? Do you feel like you actually need to be more respectful of women yourself as a female performer? What's what's the relationship there? And then I want to hear from the guys as well. Well, I mean, I go do stand up for women. That's that's my that's my my number one mission because we have to have a voice. I'm a Latin woman, and people don't expect me to have a point of view about social issues and politics. People think I'm going to go up and dance and talk about my eyebrows being drawn on with a sharpie. So it gets a little old when people are like, "Oh shit, she's talking about abortion or she's talking about whatever." But um, I think the Me Too movement has been. Listen, I uh, when people start talking to me about. Uh, falling into the, these categories of of uh, the political parties like the Red Sox and the Yankees, I'm all about the people. Uh, I'm all about the people. That when I, and when I, when I, I was registered independent when I started voting, and everything that I think about has to do with the people. So when I go out and I think about this Me Too movement that can be tone deaf at times, and I will say it's very easy for a bunch of rich white chicks who put on their black dresses and go to the Oscars and make these statements about, um, you know, about sexual harassment when women who are poor, all women are, that are poor, white, black alike, in the middle of the country have to go back to Applebee's and deal with the sexual harassment that doesn't go away. I want to hear about a movement that includes those people. So when it, when it comes to the Me Too movement, I think, good, some people are getting busted and you're hearing about it, but I still want to know about what are you putting into play that is going to affect people who don't have the money that you have and the opportunities that you have? I hear a lot of the, the white dudes sucking their teeth when I say, when I talk about, you know, the racial stuff, but it's the truth. And it's not just, um, you know, people of color who are poor throughout the country who don't have representation in this movement. There are a lot of women who don't have the money that it's easy to get on television and talk about sexual harassment and you're turning down millions of dollars and you're not, I'm, I'm not doing, but that doesn't include all of those people who don't have this privilege. And I think that at times the Me Too movement can be tone deaf and leaves a lot of women behind. It's, I mean, it sounds like as well, it is a power thing for so many people. It's like, I have the power to do this to you and I'm going to fucking do it to you because I can. And that is the attitude that needs to be cracked. Like if one dude somewhere is like, you know what? I probably shouldn't do this because maybe it'll come back to bite me. If there's even just like a recognition of that, that's the beginning. I mean, I have two daughters. They're 11 and 13. Those are their names. I was a huge stranger, <laughs> huge stranger things fan. Uh, they're great, and I want them to to not grow up in a, in an area where in a world where people and men of power can enforce that on them, no matter what. I don't care that they're white. I don't care who you are. But again, this idea that like, and I think because people minorities suffer it so much more, it the power element comes into it so much more. It's like, what are you going to do about it? What's your voice going to be? So I do think it's great that we are talking about this. I actually want to ask the, the roaming millennial about this one, because um, I, I was thrilled with Me Too, and I was thrilled to see, to you know, to Mr. Sklar's point, yeah, uh, all sexual assault is about power. It's all, all of it. Sexual harassment's about power. Rape's about power. It's not about lust. And I was thrilled to see these guys uh, not being able to walk between the raindrops with their privilege. But to me, we have a pastime in America of yanking people down from the pedestals we put them on. And until, to Aida's point, until this trickles down to where the Burger King manager is afraid to grope the girl working the fry machine, is it still just a celebrity miniseries? Or did Me Too actually have a real impact on real people? Well, I think in, like she was saying, a lot of ways, it was just this glamorized movement of, yeah, rich, wealthy people showing up to red carpets, wearing different clothing. And frankly, I think, funnily enough, a lot of the men who are vocal supporters of the Me Too movement, I wouldn't be so surprised if, you know, years down the line, we find out, oh, they were complicit too, in some way. And what's what I have found shocking about Me Too, and we've talked about it on our show, is that it's... I mean, it's, it seems shocking at how prevalent the abuse of power was. And I think you're right, like this is about abuse of power and have, have things changed for the average person because of it? Honestly, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think that it's, it's great if somewhere, you know, maybe a comedian or someone in power might think twice about it, but I don't think we've gotten to a point where the average, you know, the manager or an employer might think, oh, better not do this. Uh, that, that's all honestly probably gonna be something that takes a more of a grassroots movement from the ground up. People in certain organizations, uh, you know, bringing class action suits if it's against a specific employer, uh, stronger human resources, uh, I guess, 
accessibilities for people to address these grievances, but right now we haven't started any of that. But it's been great for comedy because progressives and conservatives alike like to see a villain taken down. So Me Too has been not just good for society, it's, I think, been really good for comedy. No, and the only thing, the other point I wanted to make is that com comedians are like the blue collar workers of the entertainment business. We don't have a union. So uh, they, you know who Amy Schumer is and Louis C.K., but there are hundreds and thousands of comedians who don't have, there are women working all over the country getting paid, you know, $10 a set who are still subject to a lot of uh, inappropriate behavior that you will never hear about because they're just not significant enough in this star driven, you know, universe. And so people don't really care about them, you know, and that, that, that we hear all the time when we go on the road. Last question, then we might have a few minutes for a Q&A, I'm not sure yet. Uh, which side is better at taking a joke? Uh, the, the side that isn't uh, shrieking in the street and chasing Ted Cruz out of restaurants and, th and encouraging its members to go to Republican houses where their children sleep. That side is better at taking a joke. It, you, if, it, you, wait, are you referring to that 1997 Clinton-era policy, the Flores consent decree, right? That was, that, was also, that was also practiced under the Obama administration. Is that what you're referring to? It's a selective outrage, it seems. Yeah, I'm just saying that the policy you're referring to was, was decided under the Clinton administration. It was enforced under the Obama administration. And people are pretending to be outraged now because they don't like Trump. That, that, that is true. That, when, when was the Flores consent uh, decree decided? The new family... Na 1997. Was begun under the Jeff Sessions Justice Department. That, that, well, uh, uh, part of the law has been selectively enforced. Yeah, You're right yeah, about okay. that, but it was enforced at other times as well. All right, I, to answer the question, um, I think both sides on the fringe are terrible at, at having jokes being poked about. People in the middle are much better. And if you can write a great joke that maybe even doesn't... Co you know, coincide with your exact beliefs, then I think people in the middle will laugh at it. But people on both extreme sides will not. And they just will not take that. And I think they both can't handle the joke equally. I think they're both snowflakes on both sides. Mm -hmm. And when I, I grew up in the 90s, so when I was growing up, I remember that anytime you heard about censorship when it came to TV shows or movies, it was always from the Christian right. Right? They were the ones when I was growing up who were saying, you can't have this, this is offensive, this must be taken down. I feel like now we're in the age where it's kind of shifted a little bit, where political correctness is what you hear about the most when it comes to censoring art or comedy. But like you said, it, it's from both sides. And you know, the, the site, I guess, that you guys run is, is it funny or offensive? I think a lot of the times it can be both. It is both funny and offensive. And Ricky Gervais is someone who offends me and makes me laugh to no end. And I think that's great. And like you said, most people are okay with that, it, with it being both. It's not either or. I think it, it depends on where it's coming from and the intent of how you're doing it. If someone is, I mean, again, a joke really matters on intent. Like, how are you using this joke in, in a way that is just to point out something that's funny or in a way to be mean? I think that comes through and an audience will get that one way or another. Yeah, and because there's the issue, some, there's comedians out there who think something that offensive is funny by virtue of being offensive, right? So they've taken it to the other extreme where I'm offending you, therefore laugh, which is not, not the case. Like you can't just say something awful and expect people to like it. And I think comedians do get called out for it and people aren't going to laugh, like you said. Um, I, I would say that I agree with him with the people in the middle. I think that um, right now it just depends on where... You, how passionate you are about what you believe in and how offended you choose to be because people who are pretty objective can take a joke about anybody. I remember Johnny Carson used to make jokes about everybody, right? It wasn't just targeting one group, but now everybody's picked a side. Not everybody, but many people have picked a side. And if you offend my side, now I'm, I'm, I'm walking out of your show. Um, but I, I, I love the people who are able to sit through a comedy show and say, I didn't agree with this, but I just thought this was really funny and I appreciate the fact that you made me think about this from this perspective. And I look forward to the day when that becomes the majority again, because a lot of people come to the comedy shows just to become, just to be outraged. They actually show up just to be upset about what uh, you're I mean, say. yes, yes. We were, we, I, I don't know, I don't want to overtake this, but I mean, I just think that, by the way, as a comedian, it is as funny fun to make fun of the left and I am a lefty. Yes. Call me lefty, but it is as fun to make fun of the left as it is to the right. 
My brother and I were just in Boulder, Colorado, and we like tried to throw away a coffee cup outside. That is the most progressive city in the world. I'm like, I've refinanced my house, and that was easier than trying to throw it away. There's recycling, trash, landfill, compost. There's a fucking goat with its mouth open. I'm like, I got so flustered, I just threw it away in a mailbox. I was like, I know this is a federal offense, but... Now, I am, so, I am so pro, like, you know, the environment, and I'm anti all of the stuff that, that makes climate change, that accelerates all that stuff, but that was a really fun joke to make fun of them because that's taking it, like, too far. It's taking it too far in some way. Even if I kind of even believe in that, yes, there should be all these things, it's like, it was fun, and truthfully, those people really laughed at it because they were like, yeah, it is a little ridiculous. And then, of course, we made fun of the fact that we thought that they would elect a dog as a mayor, a very progressive dog who's been there for 28 years. Well, four years. And uh, he's very anti-cat. He tried to deport all the cats. He was literally putting kittens in cages like they were animals. And... Uh, so, okay, now we're making fun of them for being too progressive, but we're also making fun of the right. And so I think it can be done, is what I'm saying, and it just can be done. And in that way, there was a room full of people, some on the right, some on the left, who were all kind of laughing at each other. And in that way, I do think comedy can bring people together in a certain way, and that's why we keep doing it. That's a great note for us to end on. I don't think we're allowed to do a Q&A time-wise, are we? Okay, thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Good By stuff. the way, I'm, I'm doing a special uh, all-male interpretation of Hannah Gatsby's act. Please watch me. <laughs>